Well, welcome back to the class. And let's see where we were last time. I believe we were talking about sources of capital. As is my habit, I go back and rehash from the time before from what we talked about so that it comes back to your mind what we are discussing to bring you today and then go forward. That's the whole point. I believe we were talking about uh, debt and equity, which should be in balance and what happens if they're not in balance. Too much debt will lead to financial risk and uh, uh, the limited uh, the equity. We do not have unlimited, so that will limit the growth. Okay, that's an old story. And we talked about why we need a corporation and many reasons. And my focus was to limit the risk, of course. And there are many others, of course. Risk is very, very important that needs to be limited. We had a discussion about it. <clears throat> and we moved on to the different kinds of stocks. And uh, before that, we said there was a private and a public company in the American context, in the foreign context, and we have decided which is which. So we don't have to cover all that. I've done that. We defined a corporation as a legal entity which has rights, obligations, and duties, and powers. And then we got 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 into the preferred stock and uh, and so on, common stock, the annual shareholders meeting, the international IPO initial public offering that you cannot sell the par value shares for less than the par value, but you can sell them for more than the par value. And the extra money you receive, which is above the par value is called the additional paid in capital, okay? This is all from last time, subsidiary, two kinds, wholly and not wholly owned. So we don't have to co cover that anymore. Having said that, uh, I start, and I did uh, record the, the next lecture. I think that was the fourth one. Uh, and we finished, you know, why we uh, need a public company now to, when we need capital, we need to start a public company. That's one way to do, raise capital. And one thing happened, I don't want to use the word unfortunately, but this is close to that. I did a two hour, maybe longer lecture on that subject, which is the fourth lecture, I believe. And uh, two, two, two and a half hour lecture is, uh, uh, talk to yourself, I'm talking to myself, is not the easiest experiences. I may have said that earlier in, in the lecture, forgive me if I did. It's like when I teach overseas, it's like teaching for six hours and throughout the day, which I condense in a couple of hours with you folks. Uh, because when you're teaching in person, uh, you know, everybody's sitting there, they have questions, you discuss, and uh, you, you know, you triple transparency, you look out the window, all these things take a while and then, and you know, the exchange of ideas and whatnot. And it, it almost like a five to six hour lecture that transpires that I can condense it in maybe two hours when I'm lecturing to you. So I put a lot in these two hours or, or two and a half hours, whatever it is. Uh, and so don't take it lightly, a lot of effort. And most difficult one is when I'm talking monologue, one person talking to himself, if you ever experienced it, it's not an exciting experience, but I'm, I'm willing to do it. I'm quite happy to do it. And I hope um, you persevere and, and listen to it patiently. While I do it constantly or continuously for two, two and a half hours, you have the luxury of taking a break after half an hour, you can walk out and do it the next day, the remaining part of the lecture. I don't enjoy that luxury. I like to continue doing it. Sometimes, um, uh, I negotiate with the students uh, when I'm in person that um, if they want to take a break, well, um, let's say 15 minutes, uh, we'll leave early. And if they don't, uh, no, if they don't uh, take a break, then we'll leave early. But if they take a break, we'll extend the lecture a little long, longer. So number, typically that's, oh no, our professor keep going so we can go home early. So we'll see how it goes, okay? And uh, so having, this is just introduction. Why did I give all that storytelling now? Because after I did the last lecture for two and two and a half hours, golly, I can't imagine after putting in all the effort, the whole thing disappeared from the computer. Everything wiped out completely. Happens on with the technology, there's a good and not a good. I called my TA, he's super good in computers. And I said, John, do something, you know, bring it back. Well, the other was I'll have to repeat everything and it's not going to be fun. And he tried and he tried and he tried. 
And uh, I have another, you know, my son has got a PhD in electrical engineering from University of Texas. I brought him, I said, can you retrieve what I've lost? He said, no. Nah. So what I'm trying to say is I'm going to repeat the same lecture now, which I'd done uh, before. And so you will not miss anything. The lecture is the same. Oh, well, you know, the style might be a little different, a little bit, you know, between repeating it. So you will not miss a, a one single thing. So please uh, feel, feel comfortable about that. So where do we go from now? You know, so from, I think this will be in the fourth lecture in a series of energy finance course that we started, okay? Having said that, uh, where we left off last time was, uh, uh, I think we were roughly about the time was that uh, the companies want to expand and for that they need capital and there are only two sources of capital, well, that debt and equity. Uh, equity, I mean, your friends are limited, so the equity amount that you can raise from them through shareholding is, is limited. And uh, the other option is to, to borrow, okay? And that brings in financial risk. There's another way to look at it, is in, in private company, you cannot go to the public on the, uh, in the street and say, come on now, buy my shares. Uh, and, uh, and you just can't approach them because you can only sell them to the people that know you, that you're a good guy, you're not a fraud. And, and, and for public company, no, you can't go, go to the, uh, you can go to the people through uh, approval of the federal government. Now that's what, I, so there you can raise shares or ra raise money through selling more shares vastly. Though. You could read, put an advertisement in the newspaper and say to, yeah, fellow folks, anybody wants to buy my shares, no problem. You can sell it if they want to buy your shares, if they like what you're doing. So that is a big difference now, that, uh, that way you can raise capital, don't have to go to the bank either. No, the difference I'm talking about in a private company, you can't put an ad in the paper to buy your shares, but in a public company, if you like, you can. So now the focus of today's conversation is how do we become a public company? How do we sell more shares to the public at large? That's going to be a focus. And uh, let's start with that. And to become a public, well, to, to, to start a private company, I think I mentioned it's not a big deal. Uh, you can fill up the form and give it to the state of Texas department, whichever registers new companies. And uh, that's all. We say, well, I'm so and so, my company is now, is, let's say, whatever you want to call them, uh, your company's name, and this is the telephone number, and I'm going to put up $100, and uh, the only two shareholders, my wife and I and send that form over to the state of Texas government. State of Texas, they're here now. In fact, they're in Austin is the capital. They're not far. The office is from where Jester Center is. You cross from the MLK, I think I may have mentioned earlier, the street there. And so they'll approve it, sign it, and send it back. So you are as good as a, a company. Their risks are covered, but there's only one thing you have to remember here, and that is, you still cannot go to the public at large to say, buy my share, that, I keep focusing on that. For that, you will have to go to Washington, D.C. Why Washington, D.C.? There's the federal government. That's where you have to go. Now, you're talking about serious business now, I guarantee you that. So why do you have to go to the federal government is a fundamental question. I, if I may give you a lesson in civics, no, away from basic finance, and it's nice to know that, is why do we have a government? What is the role? No, if I were lecturing in, in person, I would ask five or seven students like you, and they will give an answer and then I'll, you know, discuss each answer was right or wrong. That, you know, that's how the time is spent. And it could be a 15 minute discussion uh, with the students. So what is the right answer? What are they saying? What is, you know, and so on and so forth. But here, uh, the 15 minute discussion is zero minute because I'm gonna give you the answer. So that's why I'm saying, 
is two hours when you're in person, it's like five or six hours discussions are, uh, that take place. In the, so that's just one example. So that 50 minutes, I'm going to just to give you the answer. But besides, why do we need a government? Why do I pay taxes? Why do you pay taxes when, of course, you're going to make a lot of money? Boy, remember, you will have to pay a lot of taxes. I paid my share of taxes, and lots of them, believe me. Now, well, of course, there's some obvious reasons why we need a government and so on and so forth. Um, like in the need, we need roads. We need a you know we need the government to build the road for us as an example, uh, and so on and so forth. Okay, and you can think of many others. But to me, all of those reasons that you can think about why we need a government and why we pay taxes, and I like to focus on one more than the other reasons. And my reply in that regard is, in the government is there to provide us security. Who, are, who is us, the citizens of this country, United States? And I said, what does that mean? I've never heard of that. Government is there to provide security is the main reason you pay your taxes, Dr. Malik? Yes, that is correct. What kind of security? The first question you could ask me. Well, it's simple. There are two kinds of security that I expect from a government external and internal. So what do you mean by external? And then what do you mean by internal? <clears throat> Let me explain. External is, and in fact, that is the way we have the defense department, the military, the army, the navy, the air force, and so on, and the marines. We have a defense budget. These forces collectively cause, are in the Department of Defense, the Air Force and the Army and so on. Our defense budget is $750 billion. Billion with a B. If you still don't understand this, I can get up and write it, but I don't want to waste time just getting up and writing it. You write it yourself. $750 Add nine zero on the right side of that. Seven fifty comma zero 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 comma zero 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 comma zero zero zero. That's the amount of money we spend every year. That's in the budget this year. You can check it up in the Google to defend the United States. That's it. I gladly pay. Why? Because, I'll give you the reason. The first thing is we need to have a country called United States. What does that mean? For that, I have the Defense Department. What does that mean? So that when I'm sleeping, for example, my armed forces, my air force and so on, or the army, is protecting me when I'm sleeping. They're wide awake. I pay them to be awake. They're my guard dog. You can say guard dog in a way, no, not a right. Something, someone, some person who's protecting me. They're guarding me. No, against whom? Same against external enemies. As an example only. I'm just giving an example, nothing personal about it, that if Mexico or Canada, while I'm sleeping, the bombers come here across our border and try to take over. My bomber and my fighter planes will get them out of the sky within 10 seconds or 10 minutes or 15 minutes. They'll blast them out of the sky. How dare anybody look at us in that way? That's so that when I get up in the morning, there is still this country of mine called the United States. Before we think of anything else, we must have a country called the United States, right? And that is why every country has a defense department, not only us, every single country has to have one. It's a primary need. So nobody can invade them. 
because they have the forces on, on alert. Our defense budget is more than maybe half the world countries put their defense budgets put together. Example, China, our adversary, their budget is now about a third of ours, close to, not exactly, it's something in the range of one third, go check it out, is about $250 billion. So you understand this, the reason we have a government first is have a country called the United States, I hope you do. Now let us go on. I'll connect this to why the need for public company incorporation to go to Washington DC. I'm going to connect all this. It's not storytelling, it's important information. It's a civic lesson, which is very important for any educated person. Now he said, well, what about this internal security, Professor? Let's talk about that. Internal security is provided by our police. You see this, please? Apart from that, give you a ticket when you're driving too fast. But that, the, and that too is security because if everybody goes 150 miles an hour, we'll be crashing cars left and right. Half the people be dead and the remaining half would be injured. We don't want that to happen. This police stop you, put you in prison if you're going 150 miles an hour. Give you another reason. My old lady, that's my wife, if she walks the street in Austin, Texas, with a purse in her hand, she feels safe. That's internally in the city of Austin premises, a municipality area. So there is police, so that a crook, a crook, a big, fat, huge guy cannot reach up and pull a purse from her hand and run away. For that, thank heavens, we have and internal security through the police and so on. I, I may imagine I travel globally all around the world constantly for weeks. You can't see my house. If you came to my house, it's literally made out of glass. All the walls are glass. And I walk out and I go for two weeks to Europe. I'm not here. My wife is, nobody's here, it's empty. Uh, I empty in the sense that we lock and go. You got all kinds of stuff inside the house. So how do I feel confident that when I come back, they will make my house all the stuff inside? Because I hope, I hope and I hope, my police will be in this city, will be protecting my house, my, whatever belongs to me, and similarly protecting your house as an example. So that comes to internal security. As I said, this is about civics, it has nothing to do with finance. Now let's talk about public company and why should you go to, if you want a public company, why should you go to Washington DC? Let me write a few words so that you, you, your ears start picking it and you can take note of these words because I'm going to explain every word. So pay attention to them. Let me write it down on the board, please.
hope you're I'll push this up. Yeah, so we're Please write them down so I can explain each and every one of them. So I hope I've not missed anyone here. I just want to check again. No. Well, so I don't forget. Let me write them one more. I yeah, they space the charity. Talk exchange. <laughs> so we're going to talk about all of these things in the context of a public company. So please write them down. I'll read them to you so your ears begin to pick up the sound of these words. We'll talk about securities and exchange commission, generally referred to as a SEC. We'll talk about a, what is called a prospectus. And what does it mean? What is a prospectus? How about the word underwriter? Moving to the word underwriting, two kinds of underwriting. One is a firm commitment. And the other one is the best efforts. Followed by minimum sales clause. And finally, number five is stock exchange. So here are five things we are going to talk about. And may I repeat again, for each one example, Securities and Exchange Commission, I would ask the class, if you're sitting in person, what does it mean? Again, they'll give me three answers or four answers, then I'll discuss and I'll go forward. Then we say, what is a prospectus? Same thing. So we, you know, interact give them ideas. Why do you think it's a prospectus? They say, eh, I think, they, then I explain, then I will go on and underwriting. Wow, what in the world is underwriting? What's your idea? And why do you call the two kinds? What's a firm commitment? So you can see for any one of these topics, there would be in, in, in person. That's what I'm talking about in the class in person, uni, university or overseas. Uh, and that is for every one sentence, every single word here, I would spend five, seven, ten minutes, depending. But here I'll have to do it within a total of um, a minute for each one. I move on. So the you this contest, rather than well, 30 minutes on these, I'll do that in seven minutes probably. I hope you're getting the message. So 
uh, we're not measuring uh, on the time of what has transpired and what you've learned. We're measuring on the how packed uh, on what is the amount you have learned. Okay, keep that in mind constantly. Let's start, having said that, let's start with the first one is Securities and Exchange Commission of the government of the United States. We're going to, remember, we're going to Washington DC to start a public company. You say, well, I'm trying to explain how do you start a public company. Most people call it SEC to be abbreviate. It is a regulatory body government body, department, regulatory department. What is that? Foreign so what is the mean of a regulator? They regulate. Regulatory means they regulate every, you know, how does, how do banks should function, how the oil companies should function, or right? public companies should function, okay? How the, the hospital should function, how the electric utilities should function, you know, how the transmission line, they regulate banking and all. So all that you see around in, in the business world are not free for all, what they choose to do. All these businesses in every sector is regulated by this department called SEC. It is a very powerful department. Incidentally, um, <clears throat> they also hire petroleum engineers. You'll be very surprised. You'll have to go to Washington, D.C. Because they want to know how oil business is run. So petroleum engineers will educate them and tell them this oil company has so much proved reserves. Last year they had so many. This year they have so many. I, they have added or taken some oil out of the ground and not. And then what happens? And they have to know the people who are not in the oil business working for SEC, you know, the commissioners, they may be most of them are attorneys. So the petroleum engineer will define for them what is a reserve and what is a proved reserve, sir. So there comes the role of the petroleum engineer. They look at the company Exxon and see, well, Exxon has so much proved reserve. If they're saying they have it, they're correct. Anybody can make up a story. So there are the proof, uh, the petroleum engineers there, checking on these all the oil companies. Same thing with the pharmaceutical industry. And maybe at some point in my lecture, I hope, I'll tell you what is a proof reserve because when I travel around the world, I've discovered not many people understand what is a proof reserve. And I correct them, I said, for heaven's sake, this is not what you think. I first asked them, but 90% of them are incorrect answers. These are people who worked for the oil business for 20, 30, 40 years. And what do you think? Is a, they give me an answer. Uh -huh, that's not what it is. That's what I'm trying to tell you. And if these people who worked in this business, they don't get the right answer to a simple question like proof. And you will get it, I'm sure. In this lecture, when we talk about project finance, and, uh, and the project is an oil project, and it's all exploration production project. You know, we're not talking about refinery here. Uh, then uh, I'll have to discuss proof reserves because that becomes very important in our uh, financing. Would you, company can claim they have so much proof reserves, and against those proof reserves, they say, well. Uh, we want some borrow some money and they will serve as a security as well. How do we, I know, how do you define? So all this is coming just to prepare you for what is coming, okay? A lot of interesting things, believe me, are coming your way. And um, I'm going to take the fear out of you, you if it's finance or banking, I guarantee you that. So what is why do we have to go to security and exchange committee, the government of the United States? And we don't go, if you know, again, the focus is how do we become a public company to raise more money from the public? They want you to come there, who is there is SEC, with what is called a prospectus. There is number two on the list for things. 
You know, what is a prospectus? A prospectus is like a CV, curriculum vitae, or resume. That's it. When you'll be looking for a job, you will have to submit a resume, prepare and submit it to the employer, poss possible, poss probable, likely employer. And what are you going to tell in the resume? Basically, your qualifications and experience. I'm a, a master's uh, graduate of petroleum engineering from the University of Texas. I got 4.0 throughout. And um, I'm very, you know, what you're trying to say is a good student and meaning what, you know, hire me. Or if you have any experience, I was an intern in the company called Chevron or Shell and for three summers and I gathered a little bit of experience there. And so, so you can highlight your, <coughs> your strength with re respect to the company you're seeking employment in. And then they look at you and they interview you and say, okay. So this, this prospectus is the same thing. If you're looking for approval of the SEC to allow you to become a public company, you're going there to get an approval for SEC to allow you to become a public company so you can approach the public to sell your shares. They want you to write a book this thick about yourself, not a one page resume called the prospectus. And then you will say, I've got, I've, I've, uh, I expect, I, I've already got to, you know, shares I expect, expect, you haven't got it. We, I think we'll need about $50 million, you know, to run this company, drill 10 wells a year. And um, I've got this experience, I've got the um, staff I plan to, it's all in the future, plan to engage the very highly qualified geologists, geophysicists, accountants, attorneys, drilling engineers, reservoir engineers, and so on, okay? So this is their background, this is their experience, and so on. You can fill up a lot of pages explaining about your company that is going to be allowed by them, if possible, to be a public company. But the one thing is very important, they always insist that in the prospectus, you should use a very simple common English language. They don't want you to use some legal language that nobody understands, like here to after, here to after, here with, whereas. I'm just giving an example. So get to the point because they want to look at it and approve it. But why are they so particular about making sure you like simple? Because the little old lady over in Florida looks up your advertisement in that paper and buys your stock. And turns out by looking at the ad, looks very nice, puts all of savings of life that she lived. And it turned out that you're a fraud. And you have no experience, you're just writing it on. You have this experience. So there is where the government is what? Not doing its job of the internal security of protecting the little old lady or the little old man like me. Why the little old lady? Who has no idea anything about the pharmaceutical business and I invest in a pharmaceutical company after I've seen their ad. So the government, you come to us, Mr. Pharmaceutical guy and bring all this information so we can look it up, interview you, and see if you're okay and bona fide, honest guy. So then you know you are, you know, we're protecting the old lady. So if you buy the, your stock, at least she knows the government of America has protected her from crooks and fraud. But bear in mind, the SEC is not guaranteeing any profits. It's not saying you will buy the share and you will make money. That is not their job. Whether you will make money or not money is not their job. Their job is to just check out that you are a bona fide legitimate business operation or businessman, a businesswoman. We have to be careful these days. 
that's internal security. Now, for that, they will, you know, we have a prospectus. So once you're approved by the government, and now you're, and you're a, let's say, let's take a, and you're a geologist, okay? And you want to raise money now by selling your shares to start your operation. You're a great geologist. You boy, man, you can smell oil under 10,000 feet under the ground. Can you, do you know how to raise money? You can smell oil, there's a fantastic stratigraphic trap and you can tell it, it's there. You have no idea how to raise money. That's not your strength. I, do, have you seen a geologist? I'm a geologist too. I used to geology in 1967 as a professor. But geologists don't normally wear three-piece suits and a tie like I'm wearing today. I'm only wearing to, to show off that I have a tie, I can afford a tie, otherwise there's no other reason for me to wear a tie in front of you. But the point here is, they're very care, you know, when you look at the geologist, you know, I'm one of them, you know, there's not how I dress up when I'm at work as a geologist, I did in the past. Did geological survey with the, the hammer and breaking rocks. Ding, dip and strike, you know, meters and all. You put you put on the jeans and thick sole and boots this high and and a hat this um, and just look like a vagabond. That's the geology I did. But to where to get the money from from somebody? Those are the different guys. They raise money for you, so you go to the what? Now you have, now let's get back on track. Now, what? You have the approval of the SEC to start a company and a public company because they were approved you as a public company. You can go to, to the newspaper, but still don't know how to get the money. So you go to the people who can find, help you get the money. They are the specialists, that's all they do. You can find oil, you can smell oil from 10,000 feet, but you can't find money. You need money, capital, if you want to be in capital. So you go, where do you go normally? Money. Oh, well, you can go anywhere with money, but typically we hear that in New York, there's a stock exchange where people talk about money. They're business people, they got lots of money, they want to invest. But poor geologists like me never been to New York. I'm out in West Texas. Desert. Nothing grows. There's no buildings there. So I go to New York, and the first thing I've got to look at the bill, and I say, "Oh my goodness, man! This is New York. Look at this building. It's got hundred stories. This is about a thousand feet high. Oh, look at that one. That's even higher. And look at all these rail, these subways, and everybody's walking fast, and everybody's dressed up in three-piece suit. So you've just completely taken in by whoa, 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 whoa." That's when you come across you know, people who raise money and one of them you meet, approach, or he comes to you and says, well, let me help you get money. He's in one of the big fancy office there. He says, yeah, man, I'm here. I've got the approval of the SEC and I'm a geologist, but I want to now get some capital so I can do my business. This fellow is there to raise money for you and for you and the other people. That's where he makes a living and he, you pay him for that. Now he says, look here in New York, Mr. Geologist, we only do business when we have a contract. So let us now draw up a contract between you, the geologist and us, the under, and that person who's going to raise money for you is called an underwriter. You see the word underwriter number three? Or sometimes they look want to talk, we are fancy people, so they don't call them some underwriter, they call themselves investment banker, same as underwriter. Investment banker. 
There are two kinds of bank. There's a banker that you go to in the, the, the city or in Austin to get money in the bank. They're commercial banks. You have deposits and you have withdrawals. You write checks and you get money out. Investment banker help you get, get the money for investment. Okay. Then how is the question? We'll come to that. Or if the, you don't want to call them underwriters or investment bankers, they have another name for themselves called what? Stock brokers. Stock broker is another name or an underwriter. Call them what you will. They, and that they say, well, we have to have a contract. So let's call it an agreement. Same contract and agreement, same thing. Between the geologists and the underwriter is the agreement. A contract slash agreement, same thing. And the under, you ask him, what kind of an agreement are you talking about, Mr. Underwriter? The process of having an agreement or signing an agreement with the underwriter, that pro is called underwriting. It, uh, yeah, uh, number four, underwriting is the process of writing the agreement between yourself and the underwriter. Fair enough? All uh, you say, well, what kind of an agreement are we talking about? I'm coming from West Texas. The underwriter said there are two kinds of agreements. Let me tell you what are the two kinds uh, of agreements. And you decide which one you want. I'm, I'm slowing down, so if you're writing, you can write. One kind of an agreement, he says, to is firm commitment. Now you can read the word firm commitment. Uh, I hope you can. There's that little I there or one. There's one kind of an agreement. And the geologist says to the underwriter, what does that mean? The underwriter, do you know English geologists? Yeah. Firm commitment means firm commitment. What does that mean? I commit, firm commitment. That I guarantee that I will sell your shares of your company. It's my commitment. No matter what, I will sell. So what did the geologist say? What if you don't? What if you cannot sell the shares? And then the writer said, don't worry. The shares of your company that I cannot sell, I will buy them myself. Oh, obviously. What's it going to do? You're very happy. Wow, man, this man is a good guy. He's going to buy my shares if he can't sell them to the public or anybody. So what is he going to do? What kind of price is he going to place on your shares, the underwriter? What kind of a price? Logic. Everything is like a storytelling. I want to make the whole lecture of course storytelling. So you understand, hey, man, this is a process. It's a process. Well, if he's going to end up buying it, if they don't sell, how is he going to price your shares, low or high? This is another discussion for 10 minutes. We can't have it, I'll just give you the answer. Constantly I'm telling you, the, the, the discussions can't be, be taking place here because of all the reasons. Now, question is what kind of price? Of course, the underwriter is going to price your shares 
You're a geologist. No, you don't know much about this process. Law, for two reasons. Common sense. Because if it's a low price, people are tempted to buy your shares more. Common sense, nothing special about this lecture here. Or still, if they don't buy your shares at the low price, then the underwriter will be buying the shares himself at a low price. So this way he wins again. So he's quite safe. Do you like that idea? You're the geologist? No, you don't. You tell the underwriter, hey, Johnny, I call them Johnny. You call them whatever you want to call them. I like the word Johnny. Johnny, I don't like this contract you're talking about because you can price them low. I don't, I'm not going to sign this. But what does it tell you? Oh, by the way, there is another kind of a contract I'm going to offer you. See what you feel like that. So you say, what is that, man? You say, well, that contract is called, two eyes, you know, the number two, is best efforts contract. So what does it mean? Again, do you know English? Yeah, I do. Best efforts means what? Best efforts. That's all. That means, the writer said, I will do my best to sell your shares in the market. I don't guarantee they will sell all of them. I have no guarantee. But all I guarantee is, you trust me. I will do my very, very best. That's all. Of course. Every time they do anything, you know, the commission, if I sell, I'll charge X amount or X percent of the amount I raise. And sometimes, to continue this conversation with best efforts, sometimes the best efforts contract have a clause, an article uh, of, okay, a condition, let's say. I'm trying, struggling to give you uh, uh, different words, you know, because I said early on, I promised that if the English is not a mother language, I'll try to substitute one word with another. Oh, well, I would say condition. Best efforts contracts sometimes have a condi condition attached with them. And the condition is minimum sales clause. Minimum sales clause. It's found in some best efforts contracts. What does that mean? It means, and you write it down, all, everything is, I'm talking, everything is in the prospectus. The SEC has to look at, the SEC has to approve it. So it's not like you write doing this and you change your mind. No, 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 no. SEC is sitting on top of you in every company that is going, every single company that is public has to report all this to the, in the prospectus to the SEC, no exception. Therefore, Going public is not an easy thing. It can be costly. You can have uh, to attorneys looking at your prospectus to make sure you know everything is done legally. Because if you misstate, misstate in English, if you make a false statement in the prospectus, I guarantee you, it's a quick way to get to jail. I guarantee you. 
Don't ask, come and help me and ask me to get you out. I'm telling you. So everything has to be truth, plain, simple. A, everything should be truthful, plain, simple language. Write the perspectives like that. Now let's go back again. The minimum sales clause means that if you specify, let's say May the 2nd, if by May the 2nd, it's written, if we cannot raise or sell enough shares to raise $11 million capital, we will withdraw the offering, the offering, the selling. What does that mean? That means if May the second, we do not have whatever million, I said 11 million from the public by selling the shares, we will not continue with this project and we will return the money back to you that you've given us. That means as a hypothetical example, that we have ascertained, determined, feel that in order to have this project going, and to have the building and the setup and the whole thing to get it go moving, this company, we need at least 20 million to start. That means with $11 million, we cannot start the projects. So we will stop going forward and we will return your money. Maybe we'll do it at another time. Maybe December was not a good time to sell the shares. Maybe summer is a better time. Maybe the location, maybe the market is better in Texas versus over in uh, Idaho or Iowa or, or Wyoming. The timing could be a reason. The location could be a reason. There could be a hundred reasons why the shares did not sell. And you change that, that's called the market you know, strategy. That, and, and their specialists will help you there. <coughs> These <coughs> underwriters specialize in different, some underwriters, <coughs> excuse me, specialize in raising capital for all people, some raising capital for pharmaceutical companies, some to go public. Some do it for you know, agricultural, car manufacturer, utilities, car, how many businesses. So they know what to, when to offer the, uh, the, the shares to the public, uh, maybe the, the market conditions will, uh, they expect to change. So having done that, now you sign one of the two contracts. Now have a, you have a company and uh, you're entitled to sell the shares to the public, but the question is how do you sell the shares to the public? Traded. You buy and sell, sell shares, it's called trading of the share. Trading. You buy and sell shares or trade shares at the stock exchange. The different stock exchanges, even in America, there are more than one. But normally we hear of one most popular one is the New York Stock Exchange. There's one in London called London Stock Exchange and so on, that every country has a stock exchange where members of the stock exchange, I said members, trade stocks, buy and sell stocks. Whose question is, what is a stock exchange and how, what do I mean by member of the stock exchange? Again, Time for question and answer, time for question and answer, another seven minutes, you know, I, I keep reminding you, man, this two hour course can be six hours easily by the time you exchange ideas. I can't help but repeat it. So you get the impression that, yeah, this is good stuff. I make it light so this you keep interested in my lecture. It can be otherwise a very boring lecture. Well, the stock exchange is an organization, like another company. And what does it do? It helps its members. Not I, I'm not a member. 
to use that exchange to help people buy and sell shares, help people, help me. I, I'm going to explain that. Let's say it is like a club. If you're a member of a club, you have to pay the fee to join the club. Then you become a member, then you could pay every year, remember the dues? The last time I checked was many years back, just for the fun of it, that to become a member of the stock exchange, the, and we call it buying a seat, that's called buying a seat, S-E-A-T, that's the expression they use, is about $3 million or more, probably much more now. So once I, it's like buying a membership to the club. So once I become a member, now I can approach the stock exchange and say, sell these shares or buy these shares for me or no. The question is, what about me? I'm not a member. So in order to buy my shares in Exxon or, buy, or sell the shares I already have in Exxon, I can't go to the stock exchange. I'll have to go to the stock broker. The guy I was talking about in the back. In my case, there's no secret. My stock broker is Charles Schwab. It's a name. Charles, like a Charlie boy, Schwab. S-C-H-W-A-B, just a company. Yeah, I'm using that as my own example. So I, I use them. So I, I tell them buy 100 shares of Exxon. We already they've got money in my account with them. They'll buy 100 shares of Exxon for me. I can't go, I go through them. They'll charge me $10 commission for doing that. Next I say, no, today I want to sell 37 out of the share. That's okay, they sold. They take them a second, press the buttons on the computer screen. That's all. Or I can, they can give me the code to buy and sell my share, they can. And of course, they, if I'm a, uh, I've got an account with them, with, you know, you have to, like a bank, you have put an account with them. Then you can do it yourself. You say, well, here is the account number. You know, you've got um, account number for everything. The internet, your password. And you put in the password and you can do it yourself. But again, automatically, there'll be deduction of the commission. I would like to really, I talk about passwords. My goodness, you can see, I get a high blood pressure when I tell her for Every time to right or left, you have to have a password to look left, left. You have to have a password to look right. To look to the sky, what's your password? What kind of life is this? Believe me, you young people, I appreciate and I can understand. We never had, I never heard of this password in my life. Now you say, well, this is standard practice because you never lived the other life that I have both now and before. You have lived only one, one that is full of passwords. And I jokingly say, in the future, we will need a password to even breathe. By then, I would be not breathing because I'll be dead. I'm so old, I'll be dying anyway. So I won't need a password to breathe. <laughs> That's the point. My lives have to come. I'm not anti or end of in favor of anything. No, no, no. I'm not. I'm not here trying to preach this or preach that. It's not my job. It's a personal opinion. I'm sure the other people would totally disagree with me. The others might agree with me. So these are not yes, yes or no. These are just no. I wait to look at life. I, I, I'm using this online medium to talk to you. It's fantastic, right? In the past, we never didn't have it. We couldn't use this if, at all. We could be sitting at home and nothing possible to talk to you guys because it's a pandemic business. So there are pros and cons, and you know that. I'm just giving you an example of this. So, what is, I a, I, in fact, I've even forgotten my password for Charles Shaw. I'll have to tell them, you know, do this for me. I, I don't remember. But I did do it. So that's how. Uh, stocks and bought and sold, very simple. Okay. I hope when you buy them, you buy them at a low price and sell them at a high price. That's the whole point. So let's see what do we have. It's, I've explained all the way down, up, down number five is a, a stock exchange. Okay. 
I'm trying to make sure that I'm not missing anything. No. So I've taught you how to start a private company and how to become a public company in the American context. Okay, I'm not talking outside, that's their business. Most corporate regulations and laws, corporate, are same all over the world. I'm not saying exactly, but pretty much the same, what is here goes on, other than the definition is where the government gets involved in, uh, in a public company. Here we don't have a government, so therefore, you no, know, we have a government, thank God, that, but that's not to get involved in any business. Okay, I'm not trying to say which is better, worse, is this ism or that ism. That would be a separate lecture, and I'm not here for that. Okay. Let me wipe the board because I'm going to start something new about equity. The subject is still equity. I'm not started debt yet or loan financing. Okay. So let's talk. Let me take it off. So you take it easy. No, get fresh air, and uh, so I can start again. It's totally, totally very different form of equity. Besides share, there's another form of equity. Okay. Please write these words, please.
Okay. <laughs> Let me read them to you so that again, you ears start picking up the, the, the pronunciation of these words. It's a form of equity. Uh, the focus now is for the next, it'll take us what, 10, 15 minutes lecture, is the word partnership, partnership. Let's start with, then we'll explain everything, what is a MLP and all that stuff. Now a partnership, let me give you the background. Um, let's say there's a Mr. X, who is a rich guy, who's always looking for places to invest their money. Okay. Let me get this thing to wipe myself a little bit, please. Good. So this fellow, Mr. X, <coughs> is very, very rich, He's like you guys. And all his neighbors are rich. Everybody within half a mile of where he lives, very easy to know who is rich and not rich. Drive in the neighborhood, every house is $10 million. So you know these guys are rich, man. One day this rich man, or rich woman, it doesn't matter. Got to be careful, it's always wrong. Either way. Gets a letter in the mail. I'm talking about a little storytelling so you can understand. And the letter says, Mr. and Mrs. X. Please come and have dinner with us at the nice country club on Saturday, the 20th of April, 6 p.m. As you probably know, the country clubs are where rich people have a go there to have all kinds of fun things. No, I don't drink, so maybe there's a little bit of that too. Oh, I'm not, I've never taken a sip in my life and I don't think anybody should, but that's personal. Oh, where they hobnob, have a good time. That's what we, in the country club, they have a golf course and tennis course and swimming course, this, that. Very expensive to become a member. So invite Mr. X, say, come down and have dinner with us and make sure, please bring Mrs. X with you. First of all, Mr. X should ask them, what have you to do with my wife? You stay out of my business with my wife. I'm joking, you know, the problem is, I don't know if, I, if I'm in class in person, you can tell by the expression, it's a funny thing, it's a joke, but that's my problem. I like to play around and joke and all. But we, we did this, you know, this online, that's the part I miss the most, you know, the interaction, freedom to express and all that, because you now it's expression moving up and changing. Well, again, let's do it. And then uh, have dinner with us on whatever day, like April the 11th or 12th, the date is on the 6th of So obviously, you know, Mr. X asked Mrs. X, hey, Mrs. X, you know, these guys, who are these guys? Do they know you? No, they don't know. They only know you're a rich guy. It's easy to find out who's a rich guy. Don't tell me it's not easy. You give the mailman $10, he'll tell you who lives in that neighborhood with name and address. And I'm, I'm just making up the story. So only rich guy got this letter. And Mr. X then asked Mrs. X, well, what are they going darling or love? I don't know. I've never said darling love to my wife. She's still waiting and we've been married for half a century. I don't know when will that happen, but before I die, I'll say that. She will be happy finally. And now that's supposed to be funny, right? I don't know if you love me, but say what kind of old man is he? Talk about his wife. Because you're not married, you know. So what do you know about being married to a wife or so or husband? Never mind the story. This is a side thing just to loosen up. That's all. And then um, she said, oh, yeah, you know, I'm not doing anything on that Saturday. Like, yeah, let's go have dinner. And the letter is coming from you know, E.F. Hutton or Charles Schwab or, or American Express, a big company investment bankers out of New York. They've never seen me. They've never met me. But only get the rich people get it. 
And then writing me a really nice invitation card, embossed, looking very nice. So, so Miss Wala, yeah, 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 we'll go. So obviously she's waiting for, you know, with the neighbors, you know, why do you have to have money? Because you want to display your money, right? You got a big fancy cars and all that stuff. And then you have to have these, you know, what is this? A lot of diamonds, carrots and all. Wow, that's why you buy, buy diamonds. It's just a rock. I'm a geologist, I should know. It is a rock. But uh, forget geology here. It's, uh, you fly, hey, darling, hey, hey, Judy, what are you going to do? You're flashing all that. And Judy's doing the same. Uh, Judy's your neighbor and what are you, Ashley, or what are I don't know the names. Anyway. And then the Mrs. X takes the mink coat in Houston. You know, mink, mink is an animal. Very expensive. So you in Houston, in June, man, it's so hot. You're melting inside. But you, that's for Alaska, probably. But you have to protect the milk food, all that. I'm just making it dramatized, drama, drama, drama. So you and you go to the country club, Mr. Mrs. You know, hand, you know, however you walk with your base guy, you know, I, I walk five feet apart. <laughs> She's gonna kill me when she hears this lecture. <laughs> okay. Uh, and by the way, she helped me a great in setting this up. I'm not very good with computers. So before I start my stories, she's already said, no, all it says press record and it'll do it, and then she leaves. <laughs> and uh, so so Mr. American Express people with three-piece suits, hey, come on, Mr. X, this is a please welcome. They've never met me before. Oh, enjoy yourself. Have this whatever vodka, whatever they drink it, you know, in the in the social place. Oh, I know. I know brandy. Oh, I have no idea what they drink there. And then oh, you know, here's they have some herbs. Oh, here's the caviar. Caviar? I hate caviar. You know what it is? Is egg of a fish from the Caspian Sea, mostly in Iran area in the Caspian. People say, unless you have caviar, no, you don't have good taste, man. I say, I don't care about taste. I hate it. You may love it. I don't know. I'm not saying you hate it. I'm, I don't like it. Oh, but it's supposed to be a symbol of being rich. And they go, oh, have a seat. Hey, you know, time to go to dinner. And they sell you filet mignon. Filet mignon is a really thick, juicy steak, which I never could afford. And they're eating, you know, having a good time. By the time sun is setting, it's late into the evening, and you're drunk, whatever the drink you've taken, brandy or what, I don't know what drink there are. I'm making a fool of myself, giving you, showing my ignorance with all this whiskey business. You know? I don't know. Anyway, they get drunk. I, I hope not, but likely uh, they will. And then uh, then the, the, the guys from America Press, you know, they take out their uh, the screen and, and, and PowerPoints and all that stuff. And this is my PowerPoint, by the way. I, this is it. And then start the story. Gentlemen, ladies, we've come here to invite you. We, you know, the reason is this, because we have the super, super geologist, man. He can, again, smell oil from 10,000 feet under the ground. And he's found that there's a certain area up there in the in Texas that um, he thinks there's got a lot of oil. So he would like to, you know, go check it out and make it as a big project. We are confident we'll find something. There's no guarantee. We're going to. And so we are going to ask you if you want to join and invest in the project. So rich people. So one John Bob says, yeah, Mr. X starts. He said, well, give me uh, units in the project. Not, I'm not talking about sharing. How much is one? About $10,000. Give me one. The other guy, Bob, neighbor says, give me two. The other one says, give me four. So they're all trying to, you know, outsmart each other. They're so rich, you know. And uh, so anyway, so these fellows, the, the American collect in that night, they're maybe five, three, four, five million dollars. Legitimate, nothing wrong, legal. Don't think there's anything wrong with that. And um, then they move to another country club and another country club and another country club, and maybe three, forty, fifty million dollars they have collected, maybe over six months or two months, three months, to invest in that 
geologists feel which you can smell. <coughs> so those individuals, Mr. X and Mr. Bob and Mr. Billy, who, um, when, or this, who, who invested in the units there, 10,000, they are referred to not shareholders. It's not a corporation, it's a partnership. And they are called limited partner. You see this? Limited partner, that's, so you say, well, they are limited partners, not shareholders. Okay. And the, the folks that are going to run all this operation, you know, who are collecting all the money and run the operation, they're called general partners. See the word general partner here? Wherever? Yeah, they, yeah, you can, I don't know about this. Uh, where to put it. Anyway, you can read general partner. Funny way to teach, you know, you put your left, right, right, is top, top, is bottom. I, I run that. Anyway, so now you know what is a limited partner and a general partner. Now you they start the operation and money, and then they send you your money, dividends, your profits, you know, on the $10,000 investment, and that, that. Now you should ask me a question. <clears throat> <clears throat> they do not necessarily have a, a shareholders meeting. No, so you have no vote in per se. You know, there are pros and cons, good and bad about partnership versus shareholding or a corporation. I'm going to separate, show you the difference why I invest in this or not this and vice versa. Now you'll begin to understand really what is a partnership. And once I give you an example of the board. Now, let us say Mr. X has a thousand dollars to invest. And he wants to invest in the oil business as an example. And he has two options. He can become a shareholder in, in Exxon, no problem. For a thousand dollars, he could buy shares. Or he can go to the partnership route, calling, let's call the partnerships, calling itself ABC. Or he can buy $1,000 worth of limited partnership interest, share not share also become a limited partner. You know, you can go $1,000, put it in the partnership versus $1,000, put excellent. So the question is, which one should he go for and why? Let me give you a little background of that. I'll, I'll take both example, the benefit of one versus the other. Okay, why partnership may be attractive to some. Okay. I hope you wrote the word master. I hope you wrote the master limited partnership MLP because. I'm going to erase that. So if you're not, this is a good time to write MLP. Okay. So Mr. I'm going to give the example of Mr. X. He wants to invest a thousand dollar in Exxon and buy the shares. Of a thousand dollars. And these thousand dollar of Exxon that year had a profit of one hundred dollars. Simple as that. That's it. So that year, Exxon decides, the board of directors, of course, that this hundred dollar profit, you know, it's dividend. We are going to give it to the shareholders, all the profit. But please remember, <coughs> before they give the profit to the shareholders, Exxon has to pay what is called a corporate tax. That's the law. So 
So the corporate tax, give and take some percent, is 40%. So Exxon pays the corporate tax of 40%, leaving how much? $60. Remember, $60 only. The rest go to government. So now the $60 that are left after paying the government, Exxon gives it to them. The shareholders. So the shareholders get $60. Simple. Now what happened? Rich, rich, rich people, shareholders, pay the personal income tax, individual income tax. Let us say, on sixty dollars, they will. That's their income this year from Exxon. After Exxon paid the corporate tax, let us say they are in the bracket of fifty percent, the rich shareholders. So half of the sixty dollars, fifty percent tax back, will go to the government again. How is that? So this sixty dollars that they have received, there's a fifty percent tax on that. So at the end, they will get $30. Now that they can use to spend, buy Coca-Cola or go eat a nice meal. That's what happened. In, if you buy what? Remember, this is case A. In this case A, you buy what? The share in a corporation. I hope you understand. They're very straightforward, very straightforward. So simple. Now let us turn around. Let us say the rich guy X says, well, I don't want to buy shares. I still want to spend a thousand dollars. I will buy, you remember, limited, I'll become a limited partner and I want to spend a thousand dollars, you know, on my, uh, that's again, uh, the oil, uh, limited partnership can be oil or any other, it could be real estate, it's the same thing. So they can raise money from limited partner through oil or to real estate or anything else. So now the second case is, let us call this call, the ABC is the name of the limited partnership in which he, this rich guy, Mr. X, that's the other case, puts a thousand dollars, same as an Exxon. Like Exxon, ABC, the partnership decides that all the, and, and again, like Exxon, this $1,000 in the partnership produces a $100 profit to the partnership. Same as Exxon, nothing has changed. And now again, like before, partnership decides that we're going to give all $100 profit to the limited partners, the same as Exxon. They gave it to the shareholder, that's it. So all the $100 go to the limited partners. Limited partners. Rich people, they do have to pay the tax, remember? 50% tax, this case again. So the limited partners pay a 50% tax and they are left with how much? $50, that's it. Maybe this one. 
simple. You should be able to see very clearly. If you went Exxon route, Exxon shareholder, at the end of paying the, the corporate tax and all that, you get only $30 in your pocket. The profit made was $100. If you go to the limited partner route, you get at the end $50. You, oh man, what a big difference. Why $50? Because, uh, because I can't find another color. Oh, don't have to worry about the color. Because there's a big important because, remember please, because a partnership, partnership, unlike an Exxon, the corporation, partnership do not pay any tax. Exxon pays corporate tax of 40%. Partnership is zero tax. So all the hundred dollars, because there's no tax, goes here to the partner. In case of Exxon, corporate tax 40% is taken out, they only get 60. So, so, and then the rest of this. So what is the difference? What's the point? The point is, if you're doing the corporate group, this is corporation, you are taxed once as a corporate, entity, right, you see it. And then as an individual, Mr. X here, this is Exxon paying the, the tax. Mr. X has to pay the tax as a personal income tax. So what is the point here? The taxation case of being putting money in the Exxon as a share is taxed once as a corporation, second as an individual, and therefore there is what is called a double taxation. If you go to corporate route, you're taxed twice. This is corporate route, corporate. Or corporate, no, rather corporate uh, corporation. You the double taxation versus what the partnership route. You only taxed once. There, there is the benefit there. Of course, there's, there's a trade-off in the oil oil company benefit. So, what a big benefit! Now, before I get there, let me let me do that. Let me use up this space here. Corporate. At the end, how much do you get? Thirty dollars. Partnership. How many do you have? $50. Simple. So in case of partnership, you get $20 more. 50 minus $20. 
more. So instead of getting $30, you're getting 20 more. Corporation, you get $30 at the end. Partnership get $20 more. That means in case of partnership, you get how much more? 66.6% .6 more at the end in your pocket. 66.6% .6 more. What a big advantage. What a big advantage. Of course, there are trade-offs. And the trade-off could be because I said there's an annual shareholder meeting and, you, and all that good stuff. And you can change the management of the corporation because you're the owner. This is not quite the case in case of a partnership. And there are some other advantages of being a corporate rule versus a partnership rule. Okay. So, but definitely the advantage is you get 66% more in case of a limited partnership, no doubt about it because you avoid double taxation. <laughs> now, just to make it a little, like being a little funny, you know, I have to tell you, I had, there's no point, there's no point telling a joke when you have to tell, hey, this is a joke, you know, how, what kind of a joke is that if you're gonna announce this is a joke, but anyway, I'll tell you. So I always joke that I, <clears throat> at the end of this, <clears throat> that the rich people like you, you would know, have two problems in life because they're rich. There are lots of problems for rich people. One is rich people have invested so much money everywhere they can imagine, but there's still, still more money to invest, still left. So by buying partnership interest <coughs> units, They've what, expanded their investment portfolio. The, um, the possibilities are now, they can put some money in shares. Now they have another opposite possibility to put some money in partnership. So there's another, and there are other places. So there are more places they can invest through partnership, but there are other really good reasons. And they can't sleep half the night, because they're always thinking, where else can I put the money? Well, partnership will give them an idea. The other half of the night, they can't sleep, rich people. You should know. They don't want to pay taxes. They can't sleep. Think how not to pay. Here, what is what do you see? In case of a partnership, you pay tax once. Exxon, twice. So legitimately, legally, you reduce your tax burden away. No for avoiding double tax. So there is the answer to the risk man problem. Now he can sleep. If you go the partnership route, the world gives them another opportunity, place to invest, plus reduce the taxes. I'm not saying this, do this, this depends on individual circumstances. I'm not, I'm not selling a partnership. I'm not an investment banker or selling shares. I don't care less what you buy. My job is just to make a little funny and say, well, you know, this is a, a rich man's problem solved right here. Okay. Okay. That completes my story about, about uh, equity. Partnership is an equity. A capital structure at the very beginning, I said, it consists of what? debt and equity. So we talked about the equity part so far, this lecture series so far. Now we have to address the subject of debt. So this is a logical place to moving from one way of thinking to another way of thinking, very different, 180 degree. So well, I could continue, certainly I'm, I'm not tired, I could continue. Uh, but I think it's better for you to, you know, try to, to switch your mind to debt, loan financing, leveraging, and all that is called debt. 
So I'll give you, well, let's say 10 minutes. I really don't need it. I think for your sake, I should to get your mind to think differently about death now, okay? So let's set our watches. Give me 10 minutes, please, and yourself. And then the screen will continue to show whatever is showing. I'm not gonna write it now. And then come back and start with debt, loan financing, borrowing, leveraging. Don't worry, I'm gonna write these words on the board when you come back. 10 minutes, take it easy.
Okay, let us begin again, please. <clears throat> I put on four words on the board, and they all mean the same thing. Debt, loan, leveraging. Most people don't understand leveraging is also referred to in the context of debt or loan or, or borrowing. Hmm? <clears throat> the first and so we, the focus now till for now two three lectures is going to be on on debt. <clears throat> the question to ask is first and foremost: uh, Is it good or not good to borrow? Okay. Again, I hate to repeat. Twenty students. Half the students I would ask, and they said it's good, others half say it's bad. This would be a long discussion if I were there in person with you. So let's focus and save time because it's going to be one way, just me to you, and give you the answer. <clears throat> the answer will be made in a statement. 
and later I'll explain that. If you come across, the question is, is it good or bad? That's what I'm going to talk about. If you come across a list of, uh, let's say, 100 people who become very, very rich, and out of it, let's say, 80 persons as a list, the 500 became rich by how? By borrowing. Now, if you happen to come across another list, which is 100 people who lost everything, were bankrupt. <clears throat> and if you find 80 of them, why they became bankrupt, the answer is because of borrowing. Same answer. Very different results. Day and night difference. That's what we're going to talk about. Before you run out now and go straight to the bank and start borrowing so you can become rich, that would not be wise till you what? Here the second part of my lecture <clears throat> that you can end up being very, can be bankrupt by borrowing. So, so don't run to the bank yet. Understand the complete picture first. And it's easy to understand. Let me give you one um, example. Let us say, <clears throat> let us say I'm your boss in the department, not department, in, in, an in an oil company. Where do you want to be in the oil company? Well, are you familiar with the, well, let's call it Mozambique, just to make it interesting. I could have said Australia or Japan. Mozambique sounds a little exotic. Let's call it Mozambique, by the way, don't know. If you don't know, it's, it's a country, okay? Uh, in, uh, in Africa. And a lot of folks from Mozambique have been to my lectures in Austin to listen to me. And I've been to Mozambique myself, although I was there for only two hours. <laughs> Drove right through it. Went to the capital in Maputo and then oh, went on to, to my favorite past. There was a safari in South Africa. So that was how I went to Mozambique not to lecture there, I will lecture in other places. They have come to Austin to, to listen to my lecture, but I have not lectured. I've been there, but I've not lectured there. South Africa, I have gone there, but I lectured there also. Also went to another safari. That's a side story. So if the company that I'm heading, you're an employee, let's call you Johnny again. And I call you and it's an oil company. I said, Johnny, I want you to want to start an operation in Houston, Texas, oil operation. And I want to open an office and I want you to be in charge of the office. So you're the boss there. And important, what I'm going to say, the year is 1981. There's a reason I picked that year, not just haphazardly. That's right, 90, well, I'll give you maybe the reason why I picked that. Because 1981, I moved to Houston in 1981 for a short while too. The oil business in the world was at its peak. Oh, wow. All over the world. Everybody wanted to be in oil business, 1981. 1981, do you know how many oil and gas wells and dry wells total were being drilled every year in the United States of America? Can you imagine? No. Even I can't imagine who lives in Texas and have lived here for 51 years. More 90,000 wells, nine zero comma zero 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 nine and 
four zeros after the nine. How can you imagine that? To be exact, it'll be 89,000 and something. A year, this is in this country. <clears throat> oh, not all wells were out down at 20,000 feet in the Gulf of Mexico, no. Most of the wells were, they say, there's an oil well here and there's an oil well here and let's put an oil well between the two. That's all. How many? 5,000 feet, 3,000 feet. You kept drilling, really. Of course, there were some over, uh, out, offshore well too in the Gulf of Mexico. Yeah, it produced big time. But I'm talking about 90,000 offshore well. These are you know, all over the country, you know, in Texas and New Mexico and Oklahoma and Louisiana and da da da. da. Maximum, because the price of oil was at a peak at that time, high. Everybody was attracted to go to Houston, all over the country. Drilling was at its peak. We were drilling 4,000 wells a day uh, in, at that time. 4, that was the number of rigs operating a day. Later on, I will talk about what happened. It has to be borrowing. But let it go in, let it settle into your psyche that what I'm talking about actually happened in this country. Why am I talking about it? It has to be loan <coughs> financing. So everybody you can imagine was going to Houston with the oil business. That is quite quarter, if you ask me. And the year I said, I think, was 1981. So let's talk about 1981. So when I'm, asked, when I'm asking Johnny, my, my engineer there, to go to Houston, 1981, he lands there and he realizes he has to have a house. He's got a family and two kids. So he asks his spouse, if the, uh, uh, suppose I'm living in neutral, you know, it's good news. Um, um, Bobby, um, the, the Judy coming to Houston or Johnny coming to it doesn't matter. I have to be careful, please. Why did you pick Johnny? No. So he asked his spouse, when it is a new neutral world, how much do we have? And they saved up. And this is, I said, well, but $5,000 saved up to buy. Oh, can you buy a house of $5,000? No, you can't. So what does Johnny do? He goes to the bank. And he borrows some money for the bank and he borrows $95,000 from the bank. Together, he has now $100,000. And at that time, you could buy a very nice house in Houston for $100,000. So they move in, nice furniture, everything. The year is 1981. So let's write. Write all this. This is important. Now, this is the background to what I'm going to talk about. $5,000 is the equity plus borrowed money is $95,000. If you borrow money, you have to, you have to pay it back sometime and also you have to pay interest on that. So let us put some numbers here. The interest on, on the borrowed money, let us say 8%. And now they have, Mr. and Mrs. Johnny have how much? $100,000. Okay. Yes, 
Now they can buy the house. They buy the house and they move into the house and <clears throat> everybody and his friend is moving into Houston at that time. The prices of houses were going vertically up, 25% inflation every year. Something like what is happening here in Austin, Texas. Believe me, Austin prices are going up and up and up. Unbelievable. Two years, houses prices are practically doubled. You can talk to anybody, not the students, they're not really buying houses. Anybody outside the university environment, they say, oh my goodness, we can't believe what we are seeing in Austin these days. So it's not unusual to have that kind of inflation of 25%. We've had it here. We're still having it here on housing. Otherwise, the inflation in the country is about 8% or 9%. So the inflation is less put on. Plus, uh, this is interest rate. That's the total amount. Well, we don't have to write that. So far, no problem. <clears throat> now, 1983, this is important. I call up Johnny from Mozambique and say, Johnny, I want you to come back because I'm retiring and I want you to take up my job. So Johnny is anxious. He wants to get back and become the super big box. 1983. So Johnny now has, let's show you that. Right. He bought it for 100,000, remember? What happened in 1983, 84, 85? The oil price took a nosedive. It just crashed unbelievably. Up down and down, it crashed. What happened? Instead of what? 4,000 rigs operating, slowly the drilling goes down to about 900 rigs. Can you imagine? One fifth, 20% left. What's that? Same thing. With the, uh, of course, the drilling was almost half dead. What's happening now? Everybody is now wanting to leave Houston. Get out of there. There's no jobs. They're laying off everybody. So now what happened now is a question. The year, of course, I said was 1983. In fact, I bought the house in 1982, which I just sold six months from yesterday, six months ago. So after buying the house in 1983, I want to go to, uh, to Mozambique because my boss has come back. So I have to sell the house and 25% increase every year. So after two years, what happens? The prices of houses started dropping, no increasing from 1981 to 1983. The prices of houses were going up and up and up, remember? In 1983, let's put it this way. 1983, the price of all went up from 81, 82, 80, 25%. Therefore, the price of all of not oil, no, I'm sorry, of, of the houses went up at 20% to. Let me slow down again to get it right. From 81, the prices went up of oil and so on. And then, and now again, <clears throat> the prices kept going up to 1983. If I said something differently, forget that. I don't know what I'm saying there. Till for two or three years, the, oil, the prices of oil just kept going up to 1983. 
when I called him back to Mozambique, the prices of oil, not oil, of oil, and oil, of course, of houses are going up at 25%. So now I have to go back to Mozambique. I have to sell my house, obviously. When I sell it, I can get $150,000 in 1953 because 82 and 83, they were going up by 25. Is that clear? So I hope it is so clear, obvious. When I sell the house in 1983, I get $150,000 instead of $100,000 that I paid. So what do I do now with $150,000? I have to pay the agent, you know, the fellow who's helping buy and sell the houses, who sold my house for 150, I have to pay him a commission for selling the house for me. In America, the commission is 6% of the selling price. So I have to pay the agent what? $9,000. Now I'm left with 140,000. After paying the agent and he's happy, I'm left with $141,000, correct? But I, don't forget, for two years, I've had to pay the bank 8% interest on $95,000. Let's round it at $100,000. So interest at 8% for two years will be how much? $16,000. So now what happens? You know, I've got five, $125,000 in my pocket. Correct? Can I still leave Mozambique for Mozambique? Definitely not. Why not? You're going to tell me because I still have to pay the bank the back, the money that I borrowed, $95,000, remember? I still have to. So now I have to pay the bank the ninety five thousand dollars And I'm left with? $30,000 in my pocket. I can go to Mozambique first class. Look at the two arrows. I had 5,000 two years back. Now I have $30,000 in my pocket two years later. 30. Can you imagine four, five hundred percent increase? Never heard about it in my life. Any investment giving me that kind of return. Six times more money in my pocket. You do this two or three times in your life, you won't have to work for anybody. He, this guy is on the way to becoming super, super rich. No, this guy, whatever, Johnny is getting to be super rich. Do that, play the 30,000 again, and then again twice, but the six times, boy, very quickly you hit the stratosphere. You're multi-millionaire, no doubt. This is how you one <clears throat> can some of these people become rich. Why did it happen? Only because of borrowing. This borrowing was increasing at 25%. He only put up $5,000. He would give the bank 8%. And the market was giving him 25%. Boy, that's how some people become boring. Now, that's the good news. I said, please be careful. Don't start rushing out right away. Start borrowing money. Please don't do that yet.
I hope that is clear. It's so straightforward. I'm, I make things so straightforward. There's nothing magical about this thing. <clears throat> now let's turn around. Same story, so we can move faster. Johnny has $5,000 in his pocket and I tell him to go to Houston. He goes to Houston with $5,000. <clears> the year when I tell him to go to Houston is not 1981. That's the, that's the only difference. Change the scenario. The year is 1983 now, folks, remember. The thing I may have said it earlier, in 1983, the prices started dropping and dropping and dropping for the oil. And I told you that there were very few wells being drilled. Okay. You know, and the drilling rig count was down to 20% below 100, whatever it was, like 900 rigs were working. <clears throat> now, what's the point? The other way around. Exodus, the mass movement outside of Houston. Everybody was being laid off. People are leaving town. Okay. Now what happens? As everybody's been leaving, and that's the time when I was caught in selling the house. Prices, no houses were selling. In fact, when I was selling my house, there were 40,000 houses for sale. I asked my agent for sale. I said, no, no, don't sell it because I'm not going to be able to get any decent price. I kept it till recently. So in 1983, I go to Houston, buy the house, and then, of course, I borrow 8%. There's a difference. I call, my boss calls me back. I'm Johnny, 1985. That's when the all business, it's a rock bottom, that's why I'm saying. Instead, the price is going up at 25%. No houses were selling. They started going down in Houston. Let us say it every year, 25%. Every year, going down. Happens. This is America. I've seen this up and down cycle. Look at the price of oil. Something shoots up, then it comes down, shoots up. And we do have a lesson and a lecture on oil also in the future oil price. So what happens now? I see the oil of, uh, drop at 25%. Two years later, I'm call, calling Johnny to come back. He has to sell the house. And how much will he get for it now, two years later? $50,000 only, only reducing 25% every year. He paid 150, 100, and now he's got from 100, he's only got what? $50,000 after selling the house. And the real estate agent, remember, still has to be paid 6% of the selling price. He will only pay the real estate and only how much? $3,000. 6% of 50 is 3000 So now he's got <clears throat> only $47,000 left after pay satisfying the agent. What about the bank? First of all, he has to pay the bank. Same interest rate at 8%. So he has to pay the bank 16%, $60,000. After paying the bank, $16,000, can he leave? Certainly not. Now he still owes the bank, in what?
You see the errors? Minus. After paying the bank, 95. Johnny has got to pay $64,000 minus. Where is he going to get that money from? He is bankrupt. He says, I am bankrupt. I can't pay anything. I don't have the money. No bank is going to lend you any more money because you're already bankrupt. That's one quick way to become bankrupt. You can see that. Minus $64,000. That's a lots of money, folks. There's no way around it. Lots of if he had not invested in the house, if Johnny had not invested in the house of 5,000, he would still, and not bought a house, not invest, taken his money and put it in the house, he still would have had $5,000. He wouldn't have to worry about paying anybody $64,000. In the first case, if he had not invested $5,000, he would not make $30,000. This is the bad news, that's the good news. That's how people lose their shirt. Ever seen it? Ever heard about it? Yes. In fact, in this very city, give you an example how real it is. Real story, real example. In this very city of Austin, a person that most people have heard about is dying now, I would not name him, had to declare his own personal bankruptcy just because of this. This person, everybody in America knows him. He was a person sitting with President Kennedy in the car, same car in Dallas when Kennedy, unfortunately, was shot. He was a person. Well, of course, he was a union of the University of Texas Union. He was a person who was the governor of the state of Texas, right here. He was the person that was appointed by Nixon as the, later on as the Treasury Secretary of the Government of America. What does that mean? Finance Minister of America, the biggest economy in the whole world. He was the man at the top. Everybody in the world knows him and knew him then. Out in the Austin. This person that I'm referring to declared his personal bankruptcy right in the city. Sadly, very sad. So this is not like, oh, I know this, we can do that. No, 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 no. If anybody should have known and taken my lecture today, he's the one who should have known that. Okay? So that tells you whether you're going to be rich or poor, whether it's good or bad to borrow. Okay. Enough said about that. Now, Let's talk about a little bit of terminology in terms of borrowing. Let's write down well, I might as well because the spelling here that might confuse you. Um, okay, that this this was the easy one. I can, there are several terms that I'm going to use, okay? Like in case of equity, I use preferred stock and common stock and IPOs and and remember all the subsidiaries, stock exchange, that's the language of finance there. Like the same way we haven't finished the language of the debt yet. I've just introduced you to the subject of debt, which will continue for uh, two or three lectures. This is a long subject. So let me introduce you some terms, a little time we have left. One is called long-term and short-term. Write it down, please. long-term loan and short-term loan. Hmm. 
Let me write it. Oh, well, I don't have to write that. Long-term loan is one that is due and to be paid after one year. You can pay earlier, but any loan that is due and has to be paid after one year, at least then, after, is called a long-term loan. Any loan that has to be returned or paid back to the bank in less than one year, one year is the magic time, is called a short-term loan. Okay. Let's talk about that. Next subject. Secured loan or unsecured loan. Two kinds of loan. Secured or unsecured. Two words. Negative pledge. Fully secured. Collateral. Yeah. 
security. Debt service. debt service That service made of principal plus interest. Secured loan, fully secured loan, collateral security, unsecured loan, negative pledge, debt service made up of principal and interest, together they're called debt service. So I'm looking at the watch right here, and I think if I get into this discussion, it will take beyond your allotted time for the lecture. And I don't want to push you too hard. We've already said a lot, because these are the terms that I've planned to, to, to explain to you. Okay, I was thinking maybe today, but I don't think we will have the time to start and then finish all of these. I, that would not be a good way to start that if we cannot finish this terminology on the debt side of it. So in that, and already there's a time to quit. So have a good evening. And on these will be explained to you, at least have a mental note of what's coming and get used to this. So when we meet next time, God willing, um, we'll talk about it. Okay, have a good evening and thank you very much. Bye-bye.